What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest episode 227 at block height 637,708 on Saturday, July 4th. So, uh, happy 4th of July, and what's going on, Janine? Or as the British say, happy Trader Day. <laughs> well, whichever side of the pond you're on. But, uh, yeah, so... Putting the news desk together today, I realized that like 90% of this episode today is in one way or another related to Lightning Network. <laughs> I don't yeah, think there's a lot of stuff happening. I don't think we've ever had an episode that was like almost this homogenous of like a, a topic distribution before. Yep. It's also much shorter than usual. That is a breath of fresh air and relief. But yeah, I guess uh, you want to take us into the uh, first big announcement? Yeah, so in episode uh, 209, back in February, we highlighted uh, Jack Mahler's announcement of the Strike app um, with the tagline, what if you could pay a lightning invoice with your debit card? What if your bank account could speak Bitcoin? And it has finally arrived. Um, on July 2nd, Jack tweeted, uh, A new Bitcoin era is born. Lightning Strike Beta is available for all to download. Your debit card can now pay Lightning invoices, and your bank account now speaks Bitcoin, ready for liftoff. Um, and then he linked to a kind of announcement post. Um, and said, yo, today's the day, and even though mo much of my post will be about today, it's important to quickly address how we got here. Strike is the direct result of years of Bitcoin plus Lightning development, countless hours of uh, un unnumbered conference calls with lawyers, infinite meetings with banking partners, and many sleepless nights have all led us to today. And so Strike will be available on iOS, Android, and Chrome, and basically what it allows you to do is... Um, as it says there, interact with Bitcoin and the Lightning Network using an app that's connected to a bank account and or debit card. Um, and this is not a wallet that you will need to uh, back up a seed or manage channels or do liquidity uh, management or swaps and all of that. Um, basically, you you just download the app, link your bank account and scan. And then they also have this kind of social media profile thing. Um, like he kind of demonstrates an example of that with his own profile in the, in the post. Oops. Okay. I was, <laughs> I thought you were saying I was barely audible. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots of cat sounds. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So you, um, Basically, you there's a there's a just, eh, now I got messed up because I freaked out. Sorry. <laughs> there was a, yeah, so there's a kind of a social media feature aspect to it where you can create a profile that um, p other people using the app can pay to. Um, I kind of also implied that you could pay to the profile from an account that wasn't uh, with Strike because um, you mentioned other uh other wallet services including custodial service that um i guess work with strike um so uh and part of the demonstration that he made in the post is to show his own profile on strike and also the profile of um black lives matter which uh he's going to be accepting donations to just as part of a lot like a launch and promotion thing um, but my, for me, the most interesting part 
of the story um and given this this is an app that most you know the intent is to you know connect your bank account which granted it's um you know given the state of things it's like extremely hard to avoid doing any kind of kyc with that and i think everyone knew about that going in but he kind of provided this little short story about how he was, you know, sitting in a Chicago high rise in his hoodie, listening to what he calls suit man lawyer guy, uh, tell him about how much KYC AML they would have to comply with. And um, then he says, according to research that he conducted later, they didn't really have to do that much. Um, now, one caveat here that I kind of want to make um, as I was preparing this story um, I think the data collection and sharing involved with the app, um, especially involving their verification partner, Cognito, is a bit more complicated than this announcement and their privacy poly policy kind of lets on because people will look at, oh, only needs a name, name and phone number, um, whereas the... Uh, suit man lawyer guy was like listing off all of the traditional things that you know a bank would ask from you which is like your address sometimes utility bills a tax id all kinds of things um and he says they only needed a name and phone number um but i think it's a bit more complicated than that because um like i said they have this third party uh verification partner called cognito and um you know, that's, they have that in their privacy policy, and I'm a big fan of not only disclosing your third-party partners that may access user data, but I'm also a fan of being upfront with people about what parts of your service a person can use before they might trigger additional uh, KYC requests. Um, and so an app, you know, may be KYC-free or kyc light at lower thresholds or for certain features, but they might amp that up when you use other features and so i was under the impression that it was possible to use the app um with nothing more than name and phone number as he says as long as you aren't connecting a bank account um because when you connect a bank account like i said it's very hard to avoid kyc requirements because you're you're connecting to the traditional anti-privacy banking system and so that's why i was thinking that it would be kyc by default um, if you were using like the social profile feature to accept Bitcoin, but then if you connect it to a bank account, maybe there's additional stuff that they might ask of you. Um, but regardless, I think it's important that if it's not, the, if that is not the case, um, if there, that distinction isn't there, then people should be aware of that. Um, they should be aware of whether also their phone number is being used um, to go to some data broker or background check service to request more personal information, um, even though Strike is not necessarily asking for that information directly. Um, so, and I also want to say that some people, you know, it, even if more information is collected, they may not have a problem with that because some people can take more risks or are willing to take more risk when it comes to their personal information, and that's up to them. Um, I minimize my risk as much as possible, um, and that's why I um, I always prefer, or lately I've been preferring to use the term informational self determination I instead of privacy because um, it's not immediately clear to people or understandable to people that privacy um, as a whole is not about keeping secrets, it's about consent and being informed about where your in, your personal information goes and how it's being used. And so I'm going to be looking more into how that works because it doesn't, it's not immediately clear to me how all of that um, fits in. But, um, but I am really like, it did make me happy reading the announcement that, you know, Jack didn't, he, he obviously didn't take the, <laughs> the, uh, the advice of the, um, uh, as he referred to it, what was it? The lawyer, what was the nickname that he used? Suit, Mr. Suit Lawyer Guy. Suit, yeah, Suit Man Lawyer Guy. Um, so he didn't, he didn't just take Suit Man Lawyer Guy's, um, advice about how much they would have to do. He did try to resist that and mitigate it as much as possible, and maybe he didn't mitigate it as much as people would like, but I am... I am glad that he did try and that he 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 shared the fact that he tried and that he thinks it's still important. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's re- really, I just like a little more like clarity on those things, but it, it really does seem to me like a, a threshold based thing, like you were saying. And I mean, at the end of the day, like I was fully expecting this to be a KYC thing where somebody out there um, is getting your like a, a, a lot more personal information than that. I mean, like it hooks up to your bank account, you know what I mean? But, you know, that said, I still personally plan to use this service. And I think this is a very useful thing that was inevitably going to happen. Um, and, you know, it, it comes down to use it if you want, use it if you you don't want. And what I like about that is like, this is the the first thing I have seen forming um, other than Cash App, um, who's trying to do it right, in my opinion, and Coinbase, who is just fucking it up left and right, of a business trying to be a Bitcoin bank. And like Jack has completely taken that to a whole new level, doing it with Lightning rather than just on chain. Because, you know, the the way this is, is that this is a back end payment rail infrastructure that seamlessly links, you, you know, your fiat uh, bank account, the, the lightning network and the lightning network itself can seamlessly bridge itself to the chain. So it's, it's just created this seamless three way payment rail that can just facilitate seamless economic transacting between all three of those different things. And I'm sure that given the nature of having to deal with dynamic fiat Bitcoin interactions, like that there is hedging going on in the background, like there is some kind of um, trading activity that is required to operate this business because you're going to need more Bitcoin as this volume builds up. And I'm sure Jack will find some way to generate extra profit off of that too. So it's, it's really like he, he is building in my mind, like whatever anybody's personal opinions are on the privacy trade-offs required, like the first Bitcoin bank done right. And it, it just seamlessly connects those three different things together. Yeah, I mean, I think this is um, for the people that are already using services that um, don't have, you know, as great privacy guarantees as others. um, I still think that like this is going to be a really important service for those people, um, especially for ones that, you know, like I think the main use case is for you know if you have an employer who doesn't have any bitcoin but you still want to be paid in bitcoin this is a way to get paid in bitcoin um and not have to you know go through the process of explaining to your employer how to you know set up an exchange account and what even is bitcoin and how much how much do i get and all of that um this is going to make that a lot easier which you know at the end of the day making it easier for people to get paid in Bitcoin rather than um, just buying it and trading it is, I think, uh, a way more sustainable use case for the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah, like I, the like the the flexibility of what you can actually use this for is is really nuts. Like, you know, yeah, an employer could use it to pay somebody. Um, I can use it as a person spending dollars who doesn't care about Bitcoin to just move my dollars. And the person receiving them, the business hooked up into that, can receive those dollars as dollars or Bitcoin. I can directly pay into from the native Bitcoin um, Lightning Network uh, a merchant or somebody getting dollars on the end. Um, people could use it as an on ramp to just buy Bitcoin and send it to a native Lightning channel they control themselves. Like it, it just, it, it's just a thing that fuck tons of people are standing around and it creates seamless bridges between literally all of them for any use they want to put it to. And so, like, yeah, like I see the first Bitcoin bank done right. 
So like it, it would be really awesome to have a, a little more clarity in terms of the extra data collection thresholds that kicks into. And like per personally, I just think Jack is probably overwhelmed with getting all of this shit going and just wasn't clear on that. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I hope that that that's the case because um, the situation with uh, I don't know if you saw it, but there's there's like a ATM company that's been around for several years called Liberty X, and they've recently you know they did this whole announcement where oh you can buy you can buy Bitcoin at like CVS and Rite Aid and stuff in the U.S. Um, and you know that was that was a bit disappointing because in the end you find out oh they're actually they actually do tons of kyc even for small amounts um well i mean enough kyc <laughs> and not allowing you to really have as much privacy as you think you'd have if you're just you know buying bitcoin with cash um and there was an interesting exchange between them and one of their users where they basically said, you know, we can't even really tell you what our compliance policies are. We're not allowed to share that. Um, I hope that that's not the case here and because uh, that would be unfortunate. But regardless, I'm going to be looking into it more because I just think, um, you know, if you if you if you're going to use this service, um, you should I just I'm in favor of letting people be aware of, you know, where their data is going. Mm -hmm. but you know that aside it's it's still yeah like i i am excited to see a properly done bitcoin bank rather than a million copycat clones of coinbase um trying to do this kind of thing in the worst way imaginable yeah i mean like they i mean i i don't i don't doubt jack's intentions and i can tell that he he probably tried as hard as he could to make not only the service as easy to use as possible but hopefully as privacy respecting as he could within the limits of the system that he's trying to connect to and i don't see that happening with a lot of other exchanges so i think this is still a win in terms of you know, we should we should be fighting a, b a bunch of these assumptions, um, and I'm glad that he at least did that. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, though. Uh, I guess. Uh, Bring the flood. Yep. So this is the third, um, I think, uh, attack on the Lightning Network in the last little while. Um, this actually builds on the HTLC attack. Um, I think we covered in the last, or I, it was either last episode or 226 um, that Rene Picard disclosed. Or no, last episode is 226. Duh. But um, <laughs> it, it, it kind of builds on that attack, which couldn't really um, be leveraged by the attacker to directly profit. Um, they can just force somebody to lose money and um, direct that to a miner. And you know that's that also kind of implies if the miner is the other side of the channel, um, that gets a little more complicated. But th this is kind of a, a more advanced variation of that where there actually is the ability for the attacker um, without the requirement to be a miner um, to directly profit from this attack. Um, and so pretty much what it's what it's doing is playing the same trick of um, spreading out a bunch of HTLCs and payments um, after making a lot of connections um, to a lot of different nodes and then routing them to its own node in a, another part of the Lightning Network um, channel graph. And then what it the attacker does is releases the pre-image from his receiving node on one side of this, and then lets the pre-image release all the way back to his channels with all his direct channel peers um, with his other node. And he refuses to cooperate in updating the HTLC um, and then removing that from the channel state um, in a state update. And at this point, um, 
all of these um, channel parties have to now take these HTLCs and settle them on chain. And if you do this with enough nodes, um, you can pretty much spam up um, the mempool um, and guarantee that a large number of these HTLCs will not be able to um, confirm before the time lock on the refund path expires. And so if you do this with enough um, different channel peers, um, statistically, you actually can get um, refund transactions confirmed when they should not be um, just by clogging up the mempool. And they actually ran um, some simulations based on different block weights um, with a one megabyte block weight, um, 15 channels, um, and shoving up about 20,000 um, HTLCs or around there uh, would be enough to pull this attack. Um, and with the larger block weights, it pushes up to around 90 channels <clears throat> and comes down to around 7,000 or so HTLCs necessary. And um, you can amplify this attack kind of by waiting tactically for fees in the mempool to go down and then signing a new channel state with a very low fee because of that and then waiting until fees go up again to um, do this attack. And because of the way the lightning spec works right now, um, the person who funds a channel, which in this case would be the attacker, um, is the only one who can propose a new fee um, for the, the transaction that represents the channel state. Um, the other side um, can only respond to that and agree or not. So um, yeah, pretty much the, really the, the two um, ways to solve this I think are feasible um, is just reducing the amount of HTLCs that are allowed um, in channels at any one time, or pretty much trying to um, lengthen time locks or introduce kind of a reputation based um, web of trust, so to say. But yeah, um, you know, lightning is a pretty complex protocol and a pretty complex layer. And I have been, I don't know, I, I have not been in sync with a lot of the blind fanboying of it for the last two years or so. And it's these kind of issues um, that that's why I wasn't so yee about every little thing because these, these types of attacks, they were going to be found. Um, we're going to have to figure out solutions to them. And there's probably going to be a lot of this over the next couple of years. It's, it's a very complicated layer. And these issues don't mean it's fundamentally broken, but it's going to take a long time to really smooth it out so that there, there's not real exploitable issues like this. And that's just the reality of it. Alrighty. So this next thing is kind of a funny name. Um, it's a, a proposal for a new structure for HTLCs called MAD HTLC, uh, Mutually Assured Destruction. And so this kind of, um, this builds off of a lot of logic really looking at um, long-term mining incentives and ways to bribe miners. And, you know, one of the things that's been discussed really a lot uh, in different pockets over the years is the idea that as the subsidy goes down and fees become more and more of a miner's income, that it becomes more and more rational for miners to modify their software in a way that would um, pretty much recognize and even actively facilitate um, double spends or, or, you know, kind of bribing the miner to resolve a second layer contract incorrectly on chain just because that transaction is, is paying them more money. 
and actually, you know, robustly customize their software to help facilitate those things because it would maximize their revenue. And now th this is something that it's not, um, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. And you still run into the issue of um, if there is logic in the, the Bitcoin node at large that would prevent nodes from relaying certain transactions um, for whatever reason due to what they see in the mempool or how the mempool is being handled, then you need to find a way to directly get these malicious transactions to the miner. I knew those fireworks were going to happen eventually. Um, and so like this is this is a long term concern, but it's a very valid concern. And part of the problem with HTLCs is if things really go in that direction, the whole logic behind a hash time lock contract is that the hash being revealed allows the person receiving it to spend it before the time lock expires, allowing the person who is sending it to take it back. Well, if the, the network and the, the miner's software in that network evolves over time to facilitate these types of bribes, then that construct is broken if somebody with a refund um, you know, capability in an HTLC is willing to pay a miner more than the person with the legitimate pre-image um, to, to redeem it has. So that could break HTLCs. Well, the general proposal here is pretty much to add a, a second pre-image and another output to the HTLC construct. And pretty much the idea is that um, you know, we'll use Alice and Bob. Alice is being sent money. She still has the pre-image that if she is able to get, allows her to claim um, atomically an HTLC being sent to her um, in Lightning's case. And so that's the same. And then Bob would have the time lock path to be able to take his money back if Alice never gets her pre-image. Now that path um, now pretty much has a pre-image too, a different pre-image. And the idea is you add a third path that allows somebody with no key to spend that as long as they have both pre-image. And now see the problem here is um, one side now has the ability whenever they want to burn the money of the other side um, by releasing their pre-image to, which would allow any miner to just take that money in a transaction without needing any key. Now this alone is broken because obviously um, the, it's just scorched earth. Either side can screw the other side out of their money um, whenever they want. So that doesn't work. So what you do is you add a, um, a collateral output as well that does a similar thing. Um, and pretty much what they do is they link the pre-image releases here so that this second output um, can only be claimed after Alice legitimately claims or Bob legitimately claims the timeout. Um, and it's also got a path where both pre-images can be claimed by the miner. And so now the, the idea here is that any side that would have an incentive because they are sending money to just burn the other person um, won't do that because doing that now burns their collateral output to the miner as well. And so the whole idea here is to try to, um, you know, incentivize the miner themselves to kind of act like a watchtower um, because with this collateral now you know you could still just have one side burn the other side but it costs them something now so the incentive is not to do that now i think 
maybe that could work well, um, although it would have the cost of now an HTLC requires collateral um, beyond the payment. Um, but you bring into the picture the fact that miners can be counterparties in a channel and there's no fundamental way to prevent that um, and the whole thing breaks apart because now there is a chance that by releasing that pre-image and in sacrificing collateral um, you, you can get that back as a miner um, by mining that block and so um, yeah honest, honestly like th their answer to that potential was to just create a bunch of HTLCs with this MAD design staggered through different time lock intervals to disincentivize miners um, from doing that kind of thing. And it's, you know, at this point, um, personally, I, I do recognize in the long term, if the incentives play out that way, that this could gradually break um, the security guarantees of HTLCs as we know them. Um, this mad HTLC design honestly just se seems ridiculously complicated. Um, the collateral output requirement increases the costs of engaging in an HTLC. And um, yeah, there, there are already enough problems looking at like Rene Picard's HTLC attack where we're having weird incentive conflicts potentially between the Lightning Network's security guarantees and miners who are going to try to maximize profit. So something like this MAD design, which entangles those things even more, um, I, I don't really know what these guys were thinking. Um, and, you know, they actually do a, a pretty in-depth game theory analysis. Um, so you can read through that um, in the actual paper in the show notes. But, you know, personally, um, I, I just... I, I don't know why this was even spec'd out and designed. Um, this goes in a in a way that just lightning incentives and mining incentives just smash their heads together. And that's incredibly stupid in my opinion. Oh my god. I was talking for way too long, Janine. Well, it's my turn now. Yes it is. The, the, the cat needs to be airlifted out of the zone. Okay. Um, anyway, in, uh, in my Bitcoin privacy newsletter that I published a few days ago, and then also in BD episode 223, I talked about uh, Coinbase's potential contract with the IRS, uh, where they were offering blockchain surveillance services using software uh, and potentially more than that, that was basically built by uh, former hacking team people in the form of Neutrino that was then renamed to Coinbase Analytics. Um, and in the same database in which that request was found, uh, a, you know, just gover government uh, contracting database, uh, there was another blockchain surveillance related request uh, from the IRS that has since appeared. Uh, on June 30th, as part of the IRS's Cybercrimes Cryptocurrency Initiative, their Criminal Investigation Division put out a request, um, which is actually uh, mentioned across two documents, for information about, quote, systems that will allow developers and testers to conduct search of distributed ledger transactions involving privacy cryptocurrency coins. Um, there was kind of like a summary document of other types of information requests that they were putting out and in that document, which was a bit shorter, um, they said currently there are few investigative resources for tracing transactions involving privacy cryptocurrency coins, layer 2, uh, network protocol transactions, sidechain ledger transactions, or transactions on distributed ledgers that are adopting signature algorithms that provide privacy to illicit actors. IRS uh, CI, which is the um, uh, crime investigation uh, division that I mentioned earlier, um, is interested in examining applications which will allow an investigation to more easily trace privacy coins and other protocols that provide anonymity to illicit actors. This would allow investigations to be more effective as well as facilitate a higher level of deterrence by making it harder to conceal criminal activity. 
solutions would also provide an investigation investigative efficiency that is currently limited uh, and the privacy coins that are listed in the second document, which is exclusively about this um, cryptocurrency related request for information, um, are Monero, Zcash, Dash, Grin, Komodo, Verge, and Horizon. And uh, as you saw in that summary, they also list some second layer protocols like Lightning and also I think Plasma and um, Ethereum related ones. Uh, they also list sidechain protocols. Interestingly, they did not mention Liquid. They mentioned uh, some other ones. And then finally, they list um, tracing challenges following the integration of sh this uh, Schnorr signature algorithm, uh, which if you watch our uh, interview with uh, uh, that we are going to be publishing uh, related to Liquid and the uh, Snafu, uh, I think that's coming up today. Or no, tomorrow you said, right? Um, I forget. yeah, yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Um, so if you want to hear an answer related to that, I would listen to that interview. But um, yeah. So I found it kind of surprising that the IRS. Did I just disconnect? Um, okay, yeah, you just lagged out on my end really hard. Okay, what what was the last thing I said? Uh, IRS. Yeah, so I find it interesting that the IRS is uh, aware of Schnorr signatures and their use case for improving privacy. So that's going to be interesting going forward. Um, because at the moment, I think I think uh, Bitcoin Cash is... I, I, I'm only aware of Bitcoin Cash having added Schnorr signatures probably badly. I think we might have talked about that. But yeah, um, the rest of the document says we are primarily interested in um, an interactive prototype that provides a GUI for clustering transactions involving a user similar to tools provided by companies like Chain Analysis, CypherTrace, Coinbase. There they are. An elliptic, but for the privacy coins and obfuscation technologies um, to associate user distributed addresses with distributed ledger. What? Associate user distributed addresses with distributed ledger. Okay, that's a bit confusing. Basically, connecting user addresses of, I guess, maybe services to to addresses on the actual ledger with entities uh, suspected going to be involved in nefarious activities, provide a library of distributed addresses associated with names of users engaged in known or suspected nefarious activities, provide OSINT, uh, open source intelligence information slash research about identified users, has a mechanism for sharing investigative research between investigators and the ability to import export investigative data in various file formats and also provide an estimate of the cost and return on investment. Uh, so that is kind of just a summary of things that they want this prototype to be able to do. Um, but it sounds like at this point they're just making a request for information about uh, services or tools that would fulfill this use case. Um, so that's going to be interesting going forward. Yeah. Um, that's just not going to happen. Like, I don't think that they comprehend even a tiny fraction of what it would entail to run a system doing all that that worked. Like, you would need, first of all, no. the NSA. In way more than that you need nodes for all of these systems with massive secondary databases around them you need to parasitically insert lightning nodes into the network and either run one of the biggest routing nodes or a bunch of little ones everywhere that add up to that and pull that timing attack or analysis attack that that we discussed a, an episode or two ago um then you need to do that for all these other secondary layer, or layers like Plasma on Ethereum and all these other shit coins. And then for all of the actual fundamental privacy tech, you are going to need expert cryptographers to 
actually build up comprehensive frameworks to pull off a lot of the theoretical attacks that have been spelled out and modeled in these systems and really improve the accuracy of them. Um, that's what you need to do to not wind up bumbling behind everything like an incompetent joke. <laughs> like the, the resources for that. Um, yeah, like the, I, I'm not confident that they'll be um, for sale uh, for those types of employers. Yeah, and also, um, I mean, you might be able to find you might be able to find a service that does this for some of these privacy coins because a lot of them aren't aren't actually that great when it comes to privacy but um you know some are better than others as i've been talking about over the past several episodes particularly with the the contrast between monero and zcash you're going to get a vastly different result if you try to do this um and the other ones are I don't know. I don't think they'll compete well with that. But then when you're talking about lightning and sidechain protocols like Liquid that has confidential transactions already, um, and then talking about Schnorr signatures, which is, you know, so, so niche and not even implemented in um, Bitcoin yet, like... This is this is such a niche thing that I anticipate what's going to happen is you're going to get a bunch of, um, well, I guess because they 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 listed off um, tools they said similar tool similar to tools provided by companies like Chain Analysis, Cipher Trace, Coinbase, and Elliptic, but for privacy coins. That kind of implies that they're aware of the service offering of those companies, and they aren't up to scratch yet in in what they're looking for which is interesting because like i mean those are the big ones like if they don't do it um <laughs> if they can't do it uh they're gonna have a hard time finding anyone else you know anyone else who is actually you know doing that kind of work that will be able to handle any of this yeah you have to build it like in order for what that really would entail to become a reality, um, you would have to have a massive percentage of the IRS just become the go fuck Bitcoiners division and get an open tap on resources. I mean, some people would say that the IRS already is a giant go fuck, go fuck Bitcoin <laughs> organization. Well, no, they're, they're people who stand around and say, let's go fuck Bitcoin, but they can't actually do it at scale. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not, not in a technical sense. In a legal sense, they can, I mean, they, they fuck with it already in terms of their really, uh, you know, capital gains reporting requirements and all of that. So, and also classifying it as a commodity. Wait, d yeah, IRS, IRS classifies it as yeah so that they're already fucking with it a lot by doing that and they're and that doesn't you know that doesn't involve surveillance that's just saying well this is what we require you to do and it's really onerous and pisses people off so yeah but you know requiring is one thing being able to enforce is another yeah which i am i'm Basically, like I said, they they have a chance if they uh, basically just plug into the NSA. But obviously, that's that's not exactly a viable thing because the NSA doesn't exactly work like that in terms of you know you <laughs> they don't they don't want their abilities to be known and they would kind of have to become known if they were to participate in this kind of thing uh to the extent where you're actually like putting people in jail or something from the information that they're providing so yeah like i don't know how they're gonna do this mm -hmm. Alrighty. so uh yeah uh, i guess move along to the next one or do you got anything else to add nope all right, so this is uh, really more of just kind of a request for, for comments on the uh, Bitcoin dev mailing list right now. And I implore 
anybody who thinks they have thoughts they might offer on the subject to go reply to this because uh, there, there's still no replies. But um, Jacob Swambo, um, one of the uh, co-authors on the uh, custody protocols using Bitcoin vaults paper uh, we covered a few weeks ago um, that Brian Bishop and Bob McElrath uh, co-authored with him. Uh, kind of put out this uh, like just request for thoughts on a general um, protocol for distributing and delegating um, control over pre-signed transactions and kind of just thinking through, you know, when watchtowers were first proposed, it was really just proposed as a solution for the lightning network um, and lightning channels themselves um, in a vacuum. But it's it's really becoming clear over the last year or so that a watchtower is useful for a lot more protocols uh, than just the Lightning Network. And so, you know, he's just kind of asking like for thoughts and uh, input on like how do you put together a a protocol for that? You know, including things like um, you know a system for accountability. Like how, how do you create a reputational system that can incorporate like say a proof that a watchtower acted correctly or honestly or one acted incorrectly and, and dishonestly and potentially even, you know, start to think through maybe financially incentivized um, layers of that um, and not just r reputation. But, you know, I think this is really an area that could use a lot more brain share and people thinking about because you know right now all the watchtowers being implemented that are very very basic are strictly con confining themselves to dealing with uh lightning network um lightning channel states and the correct actions to take which are a very limited um amount of things to respond to and what to respond with um, relative to other things you could do. Um, and so, you know, let, let's put some thought into this and not pigeonhole ourselves into having a bunch of scattered, fragmented, um, you know, networks of watchtowers that can only do one thing or participate in one protocol rather than a single more redundant network of them that can handle all of them. So go throw your ideas in the hats, punks. Alrighty, and next up, um, this is actually a cool little tool that Rusty Russell just hacked together over the last month or so at Blockstream. But um, it's a, a Python test framework um, for um, Lightning implementations. And so for not really technical people out there, it's pretty much just a program that hooks up to um, the program you're trying to test and just trips all the functions. It, it does all the things that it's supposed to do and mimics anything that um, those different operations would interact with and just, you know, throw bad input, like serialize something wrong. Just play with all of the different pieces of that and make sure that bad input or, or things called in weird ways or, or orders um, doesn't trigger bugs or behavior that's not supposed to happen. And the thing is, until now, um, there's really not a general testing framework. Um, each implementation has their own. And he wrote this um, specifically working with C Lightning now, but tried to, to generalize it in a way where it's very easy to add um, like new messages or, or events to test so that it can be generalized out to the other lightning implementations and done so most importantly without a lot of um you know effort or really rewriting whole sections of things just adding new um procedures for the framework to to test and so this is going to be um a pretty cool thing to see because if people from the other implementations really jump on this and flesh this out then we can have a single comprehensive test framework that's not only testing just an individual um, implementation per test framework, but 
uh, a singular one that's actually making sure all the different implementations are interacting with each other properly. And given the nature of Lightning as a second layer and the fact that like I, I am honestly, um, there, there are probably a handful of Lightning implementations or libraries or things hacked together out there that I'm not even aware of at this point. And if, if we're going to have a huge diversity of different software like that, then for a protocol like this, we need a framework like this that makes sure they all work together properly. And that certain software interacting with certain other software doesn't break or do something screwy that could ultimately lose people money. Ooh Are we ready for the comedic break? Yes, uh, if you uh, mean the... Oh, if you uh, are referring to the clubhouse, which uh, a lot like Fight Club has rule, first rule, don't talk about clubhouse and now it's been talked about and people are angry <laughs> but yeah. yeah so basically on july 2nd two days ago um some vice media journalists published an article titled silicon valley elite discuss journalists having too much power in private app in leaked audio from an invite-only app, venture capitalists pondered everything they think is wrong with journalism. And the first summary paragraph says, just so, I mean, I don't want to get into too much of the details of like what went on and what was discussed, but they say, during a conversation held Wednesday night on the invite-only Clubhouse app, an audio social network popular with venture capitalists and celebrities, um, entrepreneur Balaji Surinavasan, several entries in Horowitz venture capitalists, and for some reason, television personality, by the way, that was not my insert, they actually wrote, for some reason, <laughs> television personality Roland Martin spent at least an hour talking about how journalists have too much power to cancel people and wonder what they, the titans of Silicon Valley could do about it. Um, so what was an immediate red flag to me about this story? And the situation is that one of the three co-authors of the article is a guy named Jason Kobler. And Jason was one of the vice journalists who did some not very at all ethical things with their feature um, or attempted feature of Chinese maker Naomi Wee a few years ago. She goes by Real Sexy Cyborg on Twitter. And if you want to hear more about that, uh, clusterfuck story. Um, check out BD episode 184. But basically, what happened in summary is they wanted to interview her about her her work as a maker, or at least that's what they said. And so one of them went to China to interview her and you know see you know how she does her work. The problem is they were kind of suggesting or implying to her that they were also interested in investigating the various rumors that were going around about whether she was possibly getting help with the work she was doing and her personal life and things that she did not want to go into for a lot of very good reasons given that she lives in China and some of those things that they were implying was happening could put her under extreme scrutiny by her own government. And so she understandably got freaked out by it and um, ended up, you know, <laughs> trying to protect herself from the fact that they were going to publish a story that could possibly put her in danger from her perspective. And so uh, what ended up happening is at the time she had like a Patreon account and uh, that was her her primary way of making money. She would post videos of her her various uh, work activities and stuff that she was making. And Vice, in retaliation for the fact that she did things to try to protect herself um, and made them look bad, uh, basically ended up getting her removed from fa from Patreon and basically eliminating her income. Uh, so she got canceled by Vice. Um, so that is kind of the background text, uh, background context to this whole story, which at the end of the day, I don't really have a lot of sympathy, sympathy for either side. Um, but anyway, so to go into this incident in particular, um, 
yeah, I wasn't really uh, interested in being on the side of the journalist too much um, because, and also because reading the article on one hand, I didn't really ever get the sense that this whole clandestine recording of this conversation, however it happened, and then subsequently publishing it in an article was really ever justified by some public interest defense because the snippets of the conversation that they included in the article were actually quite boring and there wasn't anything that was implying like criminal criminality that was being exposed so i just i just feel like this whole situation is like a bunch of relatively well-off journalists getting into a social media spat with a bunch of very well-off venture capitalists who are complaining that their portrayal in uh, some journalistic circles is not what they want it to be and, you know, very justifiably has a lot of terrible incentive mechanisms that I have myself criticized and hate to the core. Uh, but it just feels like this this whole thing just kind of got blown out of proportion. And then from a legal perspective, um, Balaji uh, personally has been kind of going on a crowdsourcing campaign for memes and legal analysis and memes with legal analysis, I kid you not, uh, in regards to whether the recording of this conversation and then the subsequent, subsequent publication of quotes from it was even legal. Uh, Preston Byrne, I saw um, in particular, wrote a very long breakdown of the potential legal consequences. And basically, um, from his understanding of, I think it was Connecticut state law, which is where he is based, um, and he believes it may be very similar to other states, um, and not even as strict as probably California, which is where these part these participants or a substantial portion of them were probably physically located and maybe the even service of the app is located. Um, the, the people who did this might be in some hot water, um, at least civilly, if, if not criminally, um, under state law. And then if it, and, you know, you could possibly get in trouble at the federal level as well, because if you have people in different States, uh, you know, that, uh, gets very complicated. Basically, at the end of the day, from a legal perspective, it doesn't seem like this was a great idea. And I feel like it was the, the these journalists took a big risk for basically no, no payoff. Like I don't I don't see what the public interest defense is for this piece other than Oh, look, some rich people are not happy with certain journalists. And they, you know, <laughs> they they made you do some things like, I don't know, take advantage of platforms that already have tons of control over a lot of people's personal lives. Maybe they won't get as much clicks to those articles anymore. Who knows? Like, I just, I feel like this just made it worse. <laughs> I feel like it just made the whole situation worse. And I don't, I don't really have a lot of sympathy for either side because I feel like they're both wrong in a lot of ways, but yeah, this is just a crazy story. And the, the only reason it's really Bitcoin related is, uh, well, Balaji was trying to crowdsource, like I said, memes and legal analysis, and he's offering bounties for people who produce them. And he's been tweeting for a number of years about wanting to fix journalism. And he himself is not a journalist. He's a venture capitalist, uh, you know, related to Andreessen Horowitz and that crowd. Um, and I've just found it interesting that, um, cause I released my revision control journalism, uh, document for the first time in 2016 and I've subsequently published another one and I've done an entire vest investigation using that model. And over all of the, these years, he's made a number of tweets about, you know, how he wants to fix journalism that sound very similar to things that I have published in my revision control journalism document, like using Git slash GitHub, um, 
decentralizing control using cryptocurrency. I mean, I don't, I didn't directly mention using cryptocurrency for funding yet, but I did mention using Bitcoin as a, um, as a time stamping anchor, uh, with open timestamps, uh, just a lot of, a lot of things over the years that are very similar to what I'm basically doing, but I have a strong sense that he will probably not ever highlight that work at all because well there's the whole complicated thing with coinbase there's the whole complicated thing with the fact that he advocated for using nsa surveillance data to do contact tracing covid19 policing that we talked about many weeks ago so let's just say it's very unlikely that my attempts to actually do something about fixing journalism will ever come into play in this conversation <laughs> Can't have shit bounce back on you. Fix journalism but... as long as you're immune to it. Mm -hmm. See, like, that, I think, is, like, the, the interesting thing here to me is, like, I see nothing but a hollow attempt to create journalists that are not antagonistic towards Silicon Valley, which has become a huge thing in, in journalism. Um, you know, over the last, it's, it's just like, look, look at Silicon Valley. It really is like a barely muted down version of the dot com bubble at this point with a stupid app for this that explodes to billions of dollars and then a clone of it. And then this other, stu it's like, it's absurd. And the media has really just kind of latched onto that as a, a thing to constantly poke at and have something to write about. And I think here is like that dynamic just ripping into a full-on rift that is forming between east coast liberals and west coast liberals in the united states yeah and the the i mean the the reason that i don't really have a lot of sympathy for either side though is because like i mean the obviously these people who were secretly recorded or recorded without their knowledge they're upset because this is a privacy violation and i don't necessarily disagree with that but at the same time it's like okay so you're saying the journalists like i mean there are a lot of journalists who they have very 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 poor respect for people's privacy um but does silicon valley have they demonstrated that they care about people's privacy? Because I I don't get that impression. I, I feel like you basically have two two sides who are screaming at each other um about about privacy and neither of them really has shown that they respect privacy very much. Like Coinbase doesn't really respect privacy. A lot of Silicon Valley based companies don't respect privacy. So I mean, th that's the reason that I'm not a fan of of most things that come out of Silicon Valley, because I care about privacy and I feel like they don't care about it as much as they should. So at the end of the day, it's like people complaining about privacy while being upset about the fact that their privacy deficient industry is not being treated with enough respect like it just you know uh just it's a little off to me yeah it's just uh two groups of assholes forming out of a larger group of assholes because they're being assholes to each other too now yep but yeah and just... i also go ahead no no you, you go ahead first I, um, one thing that I found a bit, I mean, it, he probably didn't intend for it to go this way, but when Balaji referenced the fact that, um, Jason Cobbler had, uh, uh attacked Naomi Wu in the, or the general way that Vice Media attacked Naomi Wu, um, I found that to be a bit distasteful because, it was almost like he was implying that his situation was equivalent to hers, which it isn't. Because like I said, the, the conversation the, from my perspective that got recorded was, was very boring. Like 
no one's no one's going to jail over what they said. No one's no one's going to have any have, have any um, serious consequence from what they said. Whereas Naomi Wu, um, she she literally got picked up in a van. Um, she had she had significant consequences for what they did. Like they're not comparable situations at all, and. You know what? You know you don't highlight the situation. That's fine, but to bring it up in this instance, in the context of like, look how. No. Well, a slight pause while we wait for Janine's internet to undie. Okay, I randomly disconnected. All right, we're back. What was the last thing you heard? Um. Crap. I don't remember. My head is too full of stuff the last three days. Okay. Well I'll just I'll just I mean I think I got cut off when I was just saying like I don't I don't think that the situation between these clubhouse members and Naomi Wu is comparable and that should be very clear because one side had some very serious consequences from what Vice did, whereas this is just kind of an embarrassing weird entitled social media spat. Mm hmm Yeah, I think that's pretty spot on. I just think like it's it's kind of interesting, you know, to see a rift start opening up between these different groups on the the, the left side of things, so to say, here in the US. And uh yeah. It's it's gonna be interesting to see whether they keep growing. Also you know what would be a good thing to learn from this experience is that you know clubhouse clubhouses i think it's the silicon valley produced app um if privacy is a concern they should maybe implement some features that um, better protect the privacy of their users like maybe they should uh they i mean it depends on how how it was recorded, but um, maybe they should make it harder for this kind of thing to occur. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Ready to slide along into the last two for today? Did I hit the wrong button? I heard you. Yep, we're ready. Okay. So this is actually pretty cool, and I am not going to lie. Um, I might be digging through a box for an old iPhone to play around with this. Um, but fully noted, um, just dropped a massive update on July 1st. Um, it's pretty much a iOS app that hooked up to, um, uh, your own node in the back end and it was just like a remote control for a wallet, um, running on your own um, full node. And it, it pretty much everything was completely hosted on the, the node you were running, the private keys, the, the whole wallet and everything. And the app was just, you know, like I said, a remote control for it. <clears throat> well, in this new update, they are pushing a whole new architecture for their wallet. Um, although you can still use things like they worked previously with... Uh, everything on your node and just using this as like a dumb remote. But with this release, they are dropping the fully noted wallet um, on the iOS, which actually hosts um, the private keys for the wallet on your phone, uh, your iPhone, and actually stores the, the seed encrypted in the secure enclave on the iPhone. And now, this is nowhere near the same thing as you know security um specialized wallets air gap devices um that are not your phone and constantly hooked up to a cellular network but this is a, an interesting in between that and just sitting on a computer waiting to get wrecked and it just connects to the back end and shoves a watch only wallet on there and does PSBT construction um, on the node and then passes it um, to the phone to do the signing. So 
that is pretty fucking awesome in terms of, you know, there, there really isn't a lot of iOS software out there um, that strikes a nice balance between security, usability, privacy. And I think that this new version of Fully Noted just nailed that. Um, and another feature that they have for this is recovery wallets um, that are using the same kind of mechanism as the Electrum BIP39 sweeper um, down the recovery paths that uh, Janine was talking about for Electrum the other week and can handle any combination of um, you know derivation paths known to be used by different software out there. So somebody using this wallet um, is not going to run into issues of coins selectively not being available and so on and so forth. Um, as well, um, hold on one second. Um, they have actually kind of like generalized um, the way that you're generating different types of scripts um, with the use of the new uh, descriptor functionality in core. And this is flexible enough so that you can grab um, any key from any derivation path and generate any type of um, script from that or scan the blockchain for any type of script um, from that key. So for instance, if somebody for some reason got um, your public key down a BEC32 derivation path and then made a legacy script and spent to this, um, this wallet will be able to handle um, you know, recognizing that, finding that, um, and facilitating um, the, the right metadata in a PSBT so that any kind of signing device can sign with the appropriate key. Um, so this is actually a really um, impressive generalization in terms of like that this is just really flexible in terms of what is in the user's control to do with their their private keys or their their addresses. And I think it's a real nice um, you know, kind of option to have a phone um, house the, the keys in this way if you don't have access or, or don't want to spend the money on a special purpose hardware wallet. Like this is an interesting option that is paired very well and insanely flexibly to your own full node. And, you know, I, I am not personally aware right now of a other wallet out there that supports um, in a simple way that type of generalized script um, generation from a public key. Want to just dive into the Electrum release and uh, then I can go get drunk. <laughs> sure. Alrighty, so Electrum 4.0 is out. And I am sad to say that I have not yet um, had a chance to tinker with it because I have to upgrade my node and get an Explora instance running um, to be able to use the Lightning Network stuff privately. So that's probably going to be a project over the next few days. But um, going through the release notes, um, there is a lot of really well done design choices, in my opinion. Um, so obviously, you know, to reiterate, um, you need a full Electrum server for this. Um, so you should either pick a server that you trust not to lie to you, um, one that you know the operator of, or run your own. Um, but it, it requires the, the full server to actually track the, uh, the channel output status and such on chain. So sadly, not compatible with EPS. Um, they're supporting um, static channel backups right out of the gate, though. So that is pretty awesome. That's uh, usable to kind of get the, the other side of the channel to force close if you lose the most recent states for any reason. Um, there's also rolling those into a, a simple um, backup file that can be uh, moved around uh, pretty flexibly, including um, through QR codes. 
but all of that information is encrypted to the uh, key from the wallet's XPUB. So you can only really import that and, and decrypt that from uh, a wallet using the same mnemonic seed. Um, all the lightning stuff is enabled in the GUI. Um, just flip the stuff on. Um, there is the watchtower integrated um, and support for you to hook up to a remote watchtower or configure your local watchtower in order to um, uh, allow people to remotely connect to it. Um, and also, this I am a huge fan of. Um, and, and real quick, um, they do not have multi-path um, payment support yet, but all channels are private by default. Um, this is not going to forward any payments, so it won't participate in routing if it's online. Um, and by default, um, it, it will not um, serve any gossip um, queries. So like the uh, nodes asking other nodes about um, peers or what's going on with the network, it will only consume them from other sources. So <clears throat> it's set up in a way to um, not be very open in what it will advertise or reveal to peers on the Lightning Network at large. Um, there's also in the GUI um, submarine swap support. Um, and this is actually um, a, a central backend server that Electrum Technologies is running. So <clears throat> it, it's baked right in there, but that's something you should know. Um, it is actually um, the, the legal entity of Electrum running that. Um, so something to keep in mind. And beyond the lightning stuff, um, they have shifted everything in terms of um, unsigned transaction handling to PSBT. So there is no longer support for the legacy Electrum specific um, formatting for not finalized transactions anymore. So if you have multi SIGs, um, you got to upgrade everything or they're not going to be able to talk to each other. Um, this also had the compatibility um, fix for the latest Trezor firmware that broke everything. Um, Multi-sig support for cold cards and Bitbox um, O2 support. And there's also going to be a decent amount of um, GUI changes, obviously, with all the lightning and the submarine swap and stuff. And um, there's also been some changes in the output selection um, and the coins tab in the GUI. Um, really, the only other big thing is um, I do believe that all of this lightning stuff, um, to some degree, is also being rolled into the mobile app on Android. So that is also something that's going to be fun to tinker with. But um, yeah, uh, it has been quite a while coming, and I think that the wait was well worth it. Yeah, we have uh, we have specifically been waiting for it since episode one ninety five when we mentioned that lightning was coming to Electrum. Mm. Just had to put that in there. Has been quite a while, but new toys! Yay! Alrighty, so uh, yeah, I guess that wraps her up for the day. Uh, got any final thoughts for us to go out on? Yeah, so as many of you may be aware, uh, yesterday was Julian Assange's 49th birthday, and unfortunately he had to once again spend it in prison in Belarus, but... Um, Luckily, uh, if you haven't seen it already, there was uh, a couple weeks ago, there was an interview with his fiance and two children um, about how they've been affected by this whole case. I think it was on 60 Minutes Australia. Um, so I recommend watching that if you're not aware of the fact that he has a family who is being affected by this and children who are being um, kept away from their father. And there was a really cute video that she released um, yesterday showing them not only making some birthday treats for them to enjoy themselves, but they also sang happy birthday to him over the phone. So it's good that he at least got that human connection while he's in there. Yeah, that's 
probably the most important thing in those situations is not lose all that connection. And my my general final thought, um, given that yesterday was his birthday and also I was, you know, in general just having conversations about journalism and what the best path is to follow and how to improve it. Um, and you've probably seen that I said on Twitter, uh, I borrowed a phrase from Samurai because they say on their website, build the Bitcoin privacy software that Silicon Valley would never build. And I rephrase that as practice the journalism that they will only ever tweet about. Mm -hmm. And well, I guess I'm just going to go out with a cryptic statement. Uh, you can't stop flags from fading eventually. You can stop ideas from fading. So uh, happy fourth. Catch everybody later, punks. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>